some of our key people, Henry Chin, for helping us from IBM. We will hold these meetings here. Thank you. And Ron, Ron Guerin, of course, I mean, he's really a uh, key person here making all this stuff happen. Every day. Uh, um, we're going to, let's see, I want to thank uh, Peter Norton and Tony Marchesno, uh, John Paul, Jack Google, Larry Coveney, especially Larry. Is Larry here today? Uh, no, he's not. He has a date. He is still, okay. <laughs> date. That's so important. Absolutely. Uh, Mark Lego. And uh, we want to mention the Python workshop, which is taking place on every other Tuesday at the Hudson Library. How many people have been to the Python workshop? Good. Uh, 6 to 8 o'clock. Next meeting is on the 13th at 66 Leroy Street in the West Village. We're hoping to have lots of I guess, 10 laptops at this one. Oh, I left that in there. Yeah, too. But by all means, bring them if you have them. Okay. Any other announcements? Any other things going on? People, uh, Okay, um, next month our meeting is on the 28th of May and uh, Evergrid Software will be uh, talking about uh, dynamic clustering and load balancing, uh, application load balancing. So please uh, stay tuned for that next month. Um, we also have the IRC channel that uh, a lot of folks have subscribed to and can talk on. So, Yes. Did everyone see the uh, clustering announcement for Sedan tomorrow with 184 bleaker? Some of the funds are bringing out about uh, like 17 million clusters. 184 bleaker? 72 node cl Linux clusters. Yeah. Did you want to just demonstrate it? What's that? <coughs> not the Netflix? It was on some of us. Okay. It was on the Netflix. No, no, I mean, well, I, I was out of town myself. So it, was, it looked really interesting. Okay. All right, so why don't we give out the books? And, uh, we have an automated procedure here. Do we have the tickets in the back? Yeah. Oh, we've got the tickets. So, uh, if you're interested in essential Linux device drivers, raise your hand, you'll get a ticket, and then we're going to have a drawing. Uh, the only thing you have to do to pay for it is review it on Amazon. Right. The idea here, these books have been graciously donated to us from Prentice Hall, one of our other sponsors, so uh, we ask you to please just read a blurb on Amazon and talk about the book that, that you've read. So, tickets away. Come on up if you want if you want the book, if you want a chance to win the book. Essential Linux device drivers. As coined by Alan Cox, the key kernel developer, probably the most wide ranging and complete Linux device driver book I've read. That's what we say in a lot. Yeah, I might as well take it. We're going to use it anyway. All right. Who's got that one? All right. Here we go. Number 0618013. There we are. We have a winner. We've got two votes. Here we go. 061801. Uh, yes. Please review these books. We appreciate that. Uh, Same ones again? Fedora Unleashed, the new 2008 edition. Who has read this book, previous editions? Definitely need to read this book. All uh, interested, raise your hand. Come on up for a ticket. Come on up for a ticket. Come on in. With the CD in the back. <laughs> Who has written the folder? Let's see. Number zero six one eight zero one nine. Okay. Please, please do make a mention on Amazon when you're done. The definitive guide to the Zen hypervisor. Who here has played with the Zen hypervisor? Who here has played with the KVM hypervisor? 
I went up for a ticket and a chance to win this final one. With a four from Ian Pratt. Huh? Ian Pratt of Zen Source, who presented here in 2005. <laughs> This point, I need. I'm getting way too detailed. <laughs> 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 He's good. Well, He's very good. Very good. Very good. Uh, look there. The Zen community is bringing industry forward in virtualization. And this book will play an important role in helping it grow and develop both the Zen and the cloud. Yes, we're talking about Here we go. Last book, zero six one eight zero three one. Yes. Who is our winner? Okay. Here we are. Very good. Now we check up here. All right, so without further ado here, we have two interesting technical topics tonight. First, we're going to discuss uh, uh, using rocks to build Linux clusters. And after uh, no door minutes later. or so, we're going to discuss the Cognito provisioning system. So uh, at about 8 o'clock, 8.30, what time do we wrap up? 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock, we, we have a hard stop. We've got to be out of here by 8 o'clock. So I ask people to please uh, be timely and bring the conversations over to the Stomptish at TGI Fridays, located at 56 and Lexington. Let's uh, please give a round of applause for our two our two guest presenters, uh, Vicky Bush and Rob Bush. web databases, it doesn't really matter. Because all we're really talking about is, as most of us, as either system administrators or people that are responsible for loading software know, the multiplicity these days of going into a full rack of clusters and installing something on dozens of machines gets to be really time consuming. Because even though it may take 10 minutes to pop a CD in and go, well, if you've got 50 machines, 100 machines, and forget about 1,000, you just end up spending untold amount of time. And of course, you get all the little problems. Oh, it's a one bad CD or something bad over here. So what we're really talking about again in this context is a cluster is simply just a group of machines to do a specific job. Issues. Well, we already kind of talked about the first one, time. You want to minimize the time. You want to be able to go in, get everything up and running perfectly the first time, and be able to say, stay there. So the first issue is, well, how am I going to load the software? 
second issue is, how do I know that every machine in my group or cluster has the same version or is the version that a particular user needs? And the third one is, well, next week when a particular release comes out, how do I get it out to either the group of machines or, a, again, a specific machine that a particular user needs? So what this comes down to is there are several toolkits available for maintaining these groups or clusters of machines. And this is what we're going to talk about tonight, is how we can maintain a particular group. And again, it doesn't matter whether it's Intel or AMD, simply just get the software out there loaded. So that brings us to the prime thing we're going to talk about tonight, is rocks. And I've broken it down into three <coughs> particular areas that we want to talk about in detail. So just the initial software. How do I load it? How can you see the exception? Everybody's familiar with Kickstart, right? Well, one of the issues with Kickstart is you might need to know the MAC address. Because if you're going to set a server out there, do the DHCP request on just any machine coming in, well, that really might not be a great security thing. So how do you collect all these MAC addresses, or how do you review them? And then, as we previously mentioned, software drift, skew, or particular machines having a particular version. And we all know this is a nightmare. And now a week goes by, I keep getting the little flash up on the screen. Updates available, updates available. Well, it's okay on my desktop, but on a production set of machines, how do you deal with that? <clears throat> so to sort of set the stage, there's a bunch of cluster toolkits available. And if you do a search on the web, there's bunches of them. So really no particular order or any particular importance. There's System Imager, Linux Virtual Server, Open Mo6, Oscar. I always like the little Oscar the Grouch in the garbage can. <laughs> Cyclist, Werewolf, which apparently has been bought out or moved over by Perseus as of the new release. So there's several options available depending on what you need for a specific application. Some of these things you may pick up on as, well, gee, I use them already. System imager. Probably very common. Probably just as common as Kickstarter. <coughs> it allows you simply to take any particular server or any particular PC and provision it. It keeps your golden image. Well, you don't really think about it as a cluster tool, but it's doing the same basic things as all the other cluster toolkits do. It just simply maintains your golden image and allows you to recover or do restarts if necessary. So I'm not really going to talk about these in detail. I just bring them up because they're available, they're out there, and pieces of them have their good and the bad point. Because again, there's no perfect application yet. So, since there are a lot of toolkits available, one has to ask, well, why would somebody else want to build another toolkit? Well, again, it's what is your goal? So with those three issues we talked about, how do I load the initial software? How do I collect all my Macs? And how do I keep the software SKU under control over time? Because in this sort of this environment that we're talking about, you have to think about, well, my machine not only has to run 24-7, but I might have a job that actually runs multiple days. You can't really bring it down for maintenance. So these guys out in California at the San Diego Supercomputer Center got together and by using the National Science Foundation funding, they have put together a package that, that will perform this cluster toolkit. <coughs> and they're out at waxclusters.org. It's actually very good software and free of documentation and they have a very active mailing list. Which is important in this because there's a lot of little nuances, and I'm going to talk about a couple of those, and sort of all the new people 
trip over the first time. And of course, I have to say, if you're going to do something with it, please read the documentation. You'll find that 90% of the first time load issues are actually covered in the documentation. <coughs> Once you try to get into the more advanced features, though, that's where you kind of have to really know the software. And again, since we're talking about toolkits, all we're talking about is, how do I get the software loaded? If you want to run batch schedulers or particular message pack passing software, that may be an add-on. And I'll talk a little bit about how you can get that in. So they have provided a scalable cluster toolkit for software installation in a controlled environment. Now, on some of the previous toolkits that I flashed up, some of them require you actually load Linux first. So you have to go in, take from bare metal, load the system, get it up and running, load your update. Then you go in and load the cluster software. Well, Wax does it a little different. They bring it up from the bare metal right from their toolkit. <coughs> and they use, it's all Red Hat based, so they use question. Yes, it's in there. Cool. They use Anaconda and Kickstart, but it's embedded and you don't really see it. What they have is a, a layer above it. And I'll talk about that shortly. Well, what they do is they came out with the concept of roles. So everybody's familiar with RPM as a package manager? Yes. Well, they put the roles on top of the RPM package manager. So this role, then, is a collection of multiple RPMs. And it's generally an ISO file. When you download them from the site, it's a CD or a DVD. So you have the basic kernel that you boot up, or if you want the Intel compilers, they have a role for Intel compilers. If you want to load InfiniBand for your message passing, they have a role for that. So when you come in and start your initial software load, you just basically shuffling these roles into the CD, <coughs> and it builds the distribution from there. And they do it by intercepting Anaconda and Kickstart at a certain point in time. Also, this software is used by many of the top 500 systems. So it scales from one node to thousands of nodes. There's really no difference in the software. The disk you load from the website can run thousands of machines. And it's very fast. It's one thing they've done is get it to actually bring up the nodes very quickly. Basic architecture. Again, pretty much a simple cluster. The front end or the master, we can load the initial software. Nodes, again, you can go from one node to thousands. And some things to note, is the master has to have two physical ports available for the Ethernet. And they're pretty strict about this. And it gets kind of confusing. That's one of the gotchas of the first time you load the software. If you have your four port NIC on there, well, which one comes up ETH0, which one comes up ETH1? You play with swapping the cables. Some motherboards do it different. Some BIOSes do it different. But the master has to have at least two. You could run more, but it has to have at least two. The nodes, it's only required one. And it doesn't matter if it's fast Ethernet, gigabit Ethernet, or now we're talking 10 gigabit Ethernet, it all it pretty much loads the same. And since the master has to have two NICs, it uses one for the administration of all the nodes and one for the outside world. There is a very stock firewall, but obviously it may not be recommended. So you're saying each one is a little Yes. What was the question? <coughs> ETH1 is the world. ETH0 is the private cluster. And the way the firewall stock is set up, pretty much it accepts everything from the nodes 
and it's a little more restrictive from the, the outside world. But again, obviously, you don't want to just plug it right into the uh, the uh, World Wide Web if, if you can help. It. And I'll talk a bit, a little bit about how we can actually load the software. Hardware requirements. Again, this is one of the little nuances <laughs> that get you on the master. Every every new release, they keep up on the requirements, of course. So now they're saying 20 gig. Very important memory, one gig. You cannot run it with 512 anymore. The first release I used, 512 was okay. Now they're up to one gig. Again, the master has to have two ports available. Cut and paste error. Cut and, 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 and on the nodes, it's 20 gigs again, one gig on the memory. And I put the note on there about the BIOS. The way they send out the software is you can boot a node from the CD, or you can boot it through the PXE, or once it's loaded, you can do it on the hard disk. Obviously, if you're just doing an experimental setup, you may have video and keyboard set up, but it will boot without video and without keyboard. In fact, it will boot from other boards that don't have video or keyboard installed at all. In fact, on one system, I end up pulling all the video cards out just to save power. But those are the minimum requirements. You don't need multi-core or anything like that to run. Okay, here we start getting into the software. They have two ways you can actually install the software. You can go, go to the website, download their CD or DVDs, plug it into the machine, and watch it go. Or you can set it up as a central server so you can actually have a master set up that already has the software, and you can then load other clusters from that master. <coughs> so that's very convenient. So again, if you're just going in to experiment, it's really great to put the CDs in you're up and running. If you want to set up something and do a test environment, it is worth the effort to set up a test box as a central server. <coughs> and then you can load as many times as you want from there. And it's much faster, much easier, and you don't have to play the uh, CD shuffle as much. Because what they have in there is because it's set up for large groups of machines, they have timeouts. You've probably seen where you're doing a uh, standard Red Hat install. You put the CD in there, it comes up, and it'll sit there while you go to lunch. Well, if you do that on this system, what happens is they assume that if you don't touch it, it's a node, and it'll immediately try to load a node software. The timeout is very quick. So what you end up having to do is, when you're doing the master, is you put the CD in, watch it. As soon as it comes up, you have to get in front end, hit enter, and that's your window. It actually gets the front end up and running. Required software to bring it up. <coughs> you need the, what they refer to as the kernel boot roll, which is the initial one you put in. You also need a base, which has a lot of the uh, cluster software in it, whereas the boot is more Red Hat oriented. You also have the web server role, which is what is used for the central server, adds Apache on it, etc. And the OS role. And you have a couple options here. If you download it from their website, you get sent OS. And I found, actually found it easier to go ahead and use that because what happens is, is that it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence. If you have a, this one of sent OS and their disk one OS, it's not 100% compatible. They're the same but different. And later <coughs> on, depending on what you're doing, you may need a different, different packages. So I ended up with the case of I used sent OS one time and I needed pump. So I had to go out and download it. Then there was something else I needed. So I said, time out, let me just get their software and use it. 
that's the minimum. You need the boot roll, the base, a web server, and an OS 1.2. You can also substitute the standard Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Question? Well, Orange Enterprise Linux, can you choose between four and five? Yes and no. It depends on which release you're using. Because generally what they do is each release is geared towards a more specific package. As an example, release four, or no, release 4.3 that they just came out with is CentOS, I think, 4.6. And their new release, 5, is CentOS 5. So, you know, you're, you're kind of limited because what happens is there's certain dependencies. Right. But there are, you know, I, I'm living in a world with 4.6 and have very bad experiences with 5. I don't want 5. So I have the option. Yes. One thing I won't really talk too much about, but you brought up an interesting point with the version. <coughs> if you're using different kernels, you know, you can do that, but what you end up with is you may have to recompile some of the software, which is an extra step. But it does work. Well, no, some of the add-on. In other words, depending on the um, message passing software you get, it is very specific to a specific release. So as soon as I started using 2.6.18, well, I had to do some extra compiles. Okay, so we're loading the software to the master. You boot the master with the CD, DVD, and again, there's a timeout on it. So as soon as it comes up with that initial screen, and since the software is called Rocks, each one of the versions, they name it after some map. There's Mount Fuji. There's, you know, they got all these different names. It's really nice. So it comes up with a nice, pretty screen. You have to key in front end. Question? Does it, does it um, handle different architectures at the yes, same time? Yes, you can use 32-bit, 64-bit, Intel, and AMD. On, on the same deployment? But, but no, I have a 64 S3 or Correct. Question. Yeah, again, it, since it's Red Hat based at its lowest level, you know, anything that Red Hat supports, which is another one of those kind of gotchas, if you have trouble with device drivers for like your RAID cards, different uh, NICs, a lot of times you get trouble with that. Sometimes some of these motherboards have these unique chipsets on them, and you got to, you know, like jump through hoops to get the, the device drivers. So, again, my recommendation is if you're just going to experiment, play with the, you know, generic Red Hat, and you're safe. I have had to recompile the kernels for device drivers, and, you know, it, it gets tricky. It, it's not impossible. Question. I think, I think this question was, can the different nodes be of different architecture as well? You can do cross kickstarting, yes, but it's an extra step. Mm, yes, if you're willing to do all the experimenting. They do the Red Hat, CentOS, and I think scientific. Those are the ones that pretty much are out of the box. Are like yeah. Because again, when I talked about the roles, it's all about the base. Again, it's not out of the box. I've never tried it, so I can't really answer that. Yeah, let me, let me talk about that a little bit because that's actually where this package comes kind of into its own. How they do this. Because you can think, well, Kickstart does it. 
but as if you probably use Kickstart, what do you have to do? You have to make the script. And it will load in the machine. And all the pre and post sections, well, it's great, but it always kind of, from my feel, it always leaves something to be desired. You know, it's kind of like, well, they started a good thing, but they never really finished it. So what these guys did is they took Anaconda and Kickstart apart. So they used the beginning part of it, so you get the PXE group. Then, through web browsers, they insert their screens where when you go in and install the software, you answer the questions like, well, what is my IP address? What is my fully qualified domain name? They even ask your latitude and longitude, which I never know. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> so they collect this information. They collect all this information as you're filling out the screens. And Anaconda really isn't writing them, which you might think it is. And what they do is, then is they require you to install the roles. So as you install the roles in the CD, it actually builds them out on the disk. They go out to the disk. After they're all out there, it says, Okay, I now know what you want to do for the cluster, and it builds your distribution. Then, when it's finished building the distribution, they run a particular Red Hat package. I think it's what? Uh, DHGen or something like this. They run that. When that is finished, then they allow Kickstart and Anaconda to start up again, and you get the standard kickstart script running again. And it goes out, it'll format your disks, you know, you then load your packages and run any any of the software setup in the post section. So this is kind of their magic or their claim to fame, if you will. They have intercepted this process, given you some web screens, built the distribution on your system, and then allowed the process to run, which is really great. Because after it's loaded, if you want to change something on the nodes, you can go out and rebuild the distribution on the system and then tell the node, okay, restart, and it'll reload the new distribution you have given it. So you have some options here. And it does this. Because one of their modes of operation is to handle the software skew is you just reload the nodes. Okay, that, that brings up another question. If you're running a job that span multiple days or even weeks, does that mean you're stuck with software skew until you get a window of opportunity to reload the nodes? Well, potentially, but it's, uh, my answer to that would be Usually, depending on the size of the cluster, you may not have one user dominating all the nodes at once. You may have the opportunity to say, okay, this section of nodes, I'm going to shut down, reload, and then when this guy, his job finishes, whether it's on one node or a hundred nodes, then I would do that step. So the answer is yes. I have to wait for one of Yes. Because if you think about the classic operation that this is in, somebody submits a job and they want to use 100% of the CPU. They don't want to run, you know, 50% on one CPU, 25% on another CPU. You want to hit that system hard, you want to use all the resources, you want to get in and get out. Okay, so We've loaded the software, we've answered our configuration questions, you reboot the master, it'll come up do the post section. To get the nodes installed, you run a program called Insert Ethers, and this is where you gather the maps. And it does it off of the administration LAN. So the way you do it is you just go in, key in Insert Ethers, it comes up with a screen, what am I loading? Okay, worker node, you select it, then you can power on the nodes. And as the nodes come up for the PXE, it <coughs> gathers the max, puts them in a database, and does all the, the magic for you at this time. And it's pretty much unattended at this point. <coughs> so if a node goes down, so what they do is when it boots up, they set it to reload. So if you power it down normally, the process is they'll reset that. So they've already got it set in there, so if the node crashes, 
ってるわけです。<笑>
Here is the court. Um, 
talked a little bit about this earlier. Uh, so we can do in imports from DVDs. Um, we can do imports from different file systems. Uh, we can maintain an R sync between different repositories. So you can set up cron to do R sync. <coughs> uh, but then the question becomes, well, if you already have a mechanism for maintaining your repository, why do you want Cobbler to manage it? Well, the answer is you don't. You can just tell Cobbler there is an existing repository, just use it. <coughs> right? So you don't have to have Cobbler manage where the repository is getting going. The other interesting feature is FixPart template. So if you think of FixPart, um, the number of variations of FixPart files get to manage typically can get pretty thick. So one of the things that Cobbler does is it allows the template to FixPart file. And the templating mechanism is based on Python Cheetah templating mechanism. So if you know Python and you know Cheetah, then the templating mechanism is pretty, pretty easy. But uh, you can have multiple levels of templates and have inheritance based on those profiles and templates. Um, currently, uh, we do integrated DHCP management through either the ISC DHCP server or through DNS mask. So you know, for small installations, you know, having DNS mask to DNS DHCP is great. Uh, for larger installations, you can start using ISC DHCP uh, server. Another uh, interesting part is triggers and modules. So, Cobbler is designed to be extended, and the way we provide extensibility is to allow you to write modules to do different functions inside of Cobbler. So you can write modules in Python <coughs> and insert it into the Cobbler framework and have those functions be invoked at appropriate times. If you don't want to write modules to extend Cobbler itself, but you want certain actions to take place when systems get installed or a piece different actions are happening, there's a capability for triggers. Um, so triggers will invoke actions on your you know, standard scripts that you can write, batch scripts, curl scripts, whatever you want, uh, based on actions that are happening on system repositories. Uh, it does have a comprehensive fault. Well, let's say comprehensive that it's evolving web interface. So you don't have to use the command line if you want if you didn't want to. Uh, and then finally, we have an XML RPC interface. So one of the things that we had as a design goal when we were starting Cobbler was whatever we presented as part of the web interface had to be available by an API. <coughs> so if you want to script and integrate it into your own processes and automation framework, you could do that. So the XML RPC API is exactly what is used by the web interface and is available for scripting. So an automation perspective. Um, in terms of usage, um, Cobbler has been out for a while. Um, we're about to release version one, hopefully, this summer. Um, we do have a couple of uh, couple labs and universities, and a lot of hosting companies are using it in terms of uh, scale. Um, we're currently, uh, some of the customers have reported, well, not customers, users have reported that they're managing up to about 2,000 to 3,000 hosts. Um, but these are still in the single data center environment, so we're not scaling to multiple data center environments. And so one of the projects this summer is to make sure that Cobbler can manage multiple data centers. And one of the ways we're doing that is extending Cobbler so that multiple instances can propagate amongst themselves and all the information they respect to each part of the program. Um, so the supported platforms. So Cobbler, you know, is a Red Hat project, supports <coughs> Fedora and the Red Hat pieces. Um, but we also have started uh, doing some other things <coughs> for all the Debian pieces um, and SUSE. Uh, so SUSE is fully supported with the OES pieces. Uh, you know, Microsoft stuff. Uh, of course. But if you have patches, you have to be So Cone. Um, so Cone is is another piece of the popular puzzle. So Cone is what we use to do reinstallations. Uh, so Cone is a separate RPM, has very few dependencies, and is pretty much written in Python. And we use Cone to do reinstallations or to actually uh, deploy virtual machines. And we'll talk about how that happens. So Cobbler itself needs to run on Bell 4 or above, or if you're a 7 or above. But code can run all the way down to And Cobbler is an app, right? Cobbler is an app, yes. Okay. So, 
Apple is the um, extended repository for Enterprise Linux. It's part of the Fedora project. It used to be Fedora Linux for this. So, Cobbler, in terms of just bringing it up, uh, is relatively simple. Cobbler is a single RPM. Um, there are a couple of dependencies on it, but if you install Cobbler and run a command called Cobbler space check, it will tell you whether you're setting the correct or not. What are the things that you need to check? Um, once you're sort of configured Cobbler and it's ready uh, for its environment, um, then we can sort of do a couple of imports. Uh, we can import the distributions, um, so we have some RPMs to be able to deploy. And then from there, we get into <coughs> the actual work of uh, provisioning. Uh, so there's Pixie, uh, we can manage the Pixie system with the menus, um, and, and then have phone and then add system options. So let's talk about some of these cases. So internally in Combo, we organize things again. There's templates um, involved in all of these things. Um, fundamentally, there's a profile, and profiles are what combine a lot of different pieces together. Uh, the first thing that the profile needs to have is a repository. So, uh, a repository can, again, have multiple pieces under it, but you can have repositories available over FTP, HTTP, NFS. Um, they can be managed directly by Cobbler, or you can reference it from the repository. Um, the profiles can be linked. Um, so systems can link to an individual profile. Um, so you can have a profile that's a web server or a database server and so on, and have particular settings for those. Or you can have a, have a profile that says, you know, this is some weird box with it, you know, that needs to move with certain kernel options and create a profile for that if you wanted to. Uh, you can also have system-specific overrides for what, whatever is in the profile. So again, from a templating perspective, we have a lot of inheritance capabilities. So we can define broad categories in the profile or in our distribution and then have overrides. Um, as part of the inheritance, you can also do multiple sub-profiles as well. You can do inheritance of the profile. Could you repeat the question, please? So the question was, why, we, why am I putting distros a like of profile one you could destroy, not the other way around. Um, what, so, so what we're doing is the repository. So traditionally, when we think of this distro, as we're thinking of you know, a Red Hat distro or a, a Sysa distro. Um, here we're sort of changing it slightly and saying that the, the, the distro is really what ends up on the box. And that has a larger meaning because that would include your configuration for your boot options and how you configure the system. Right. So, what you're thinking, particularly of this row, <coughs> in terms, would be right now. Right. I'm not going to be an app box, it's going to be a web box. I'm not thinking this is a red hat or a red hat box. The, right, the red hat versus Debian box would be captured by the repo aspect. The app dev, um, whether it's a web server or a database server, is partly captured here. And then these two pieces, these three pieces, together make up the final distribution that goes on that place. So. Um, for a system itself, we describe a system based on its MAC address. So um, you can define it by the MAC address. You can define some IP address information if you want to do static IP addresses. Um, and you can define additional metadata. So if you want to capture some uh, information about the system, um, you can define independent metadata and then sync it to a particular profile. So, so that's from the system perspective. Cobbler itself has a number of settings that we need to worry about. Um, because we're talking about Pixie and DHCP uh, information, one of the settings in Cobbler is who's going to actually serve off this information. So where is my Pixie server? Where is my uh, DHCP? So the server address is, real, is pointing to whoever's providing the Pixie information. So if you have uh, a single cobbler instance, for example, managing multiple subnets or multiple data centers and you have local DHCP servers, you could have 
a generic definition in Cobbler that says my next server for Pixie is X, Y, and Z, but for an individual server or an individual um, profile that might go into a remote data center, you can overwrite that by saying overwrite the default server info by using the local Pixie server. Um, so that's the server information address. Whether we manage the DHCP itself or not. So right now we have a capability to add entries into the ISC DHCP um, information, but we're also looking at so when you typically add information into the into the DHCP configuration file, the only way DHCP knows about it is if we start the DHCP um, So one of the mechanisms we're looking at is using the OMAP interface into the DHCP so we don't have to restart that DHCP server. So it will go in, check the lease file, see if that server is being reinstalled. If so, we, we might want to take that lease file out or and then add that DHCP information. Um, again, whether we're acting as a mirror or not, so whether we're wanting to sync up with additional repositories, um, whether we want to enable the XML RPC interface or not. So if you're going to use the web interface, you have to enable the XML RPC, or if you're going to use the XML RPC interface as part of an overall process, uh, this needs to be enabled. And there are a few other settings um, that come into play. So one of the things that are getting inherited when we get into the business growth phase, um, we have the main um, that's being defined for the business growth, the kernel, um, and we'll actually point to a particular file uh, <coughs> that's being used. In an already that we're going to use to boot, <coughs> kernel options that are present, um, architecture. Um, so right now we support the 32 and 64 bit Intel AMD architectures, the Itanium architecture. Uh, PPC should be online soon. Uh, you can do it directly to S390s, but we're looking at porting code to make sure that code will work in terms of reinstallation on the S390. The breed option allows you to specify whether it's Red Hat, Debian, SUSE, uh, because our options are handled differently. Uh, uh, and then the Kickstart meta information. Uh, so you uh, when you say the experience to the 64 bit, you'll do the AMD as well? Yeah, mm -hmm. the same. Okay. From a boot perspective, they also do uh, And actually, from a 32 64 bit, they also really don't make sense. Uh, you can install the same hardware. Uh, the only difference from a boot perspective is when you get into the applications, because then you have to find out how many guys. Repo perspective. Um, the repo, you have a name for it, an architecture if you want to define it. So uh, the default would be an Intel AMD architecture. Uh, whether we're mirroring it or not, so let's the update error uh, for that. Whether we want to keep it updated, uh, again, from an automated synchronization <coughs> perspective. Um, if there are any priorities, so if you have multiple repositories available uh, in your environment, which one gets priority over what? Um, and then if you want to use create repo flags to add additional capability. So, so create repo is one of those requirements. So putting it all together, um, Cobbler D is the process that's running on the system um, when Cobbler is up. Um, and then there's this command called Cobbler, which is what is used to execute the actual, actual um, tasks. Uh, when you use the web interface, the web interface talks XML RPC to the Cobbler D um, and then Cone, which is the client piece, will also talk XML RPC to uh, the Cobbler D. Uh, the API is common, so from a coding perspective and a management perspective, we're trying to make sure that the API is stable so that as other people write other applications against it, um, it will stay relatively stable. And then we have modules for accessibility. So one thing we haven't really talked about is, well, you know, who gets to install a system? <coughs> who gets to define what a K-Star file looks like? If you're talking about data centers with large number of systems, that becomes important if you want to be able to do some library capabilities. Uh, okay, so, um, so one of the things that 
we have in place right now is an authentication module. So we can authenticate users against um, anything that pretty much Apache works with. So um, LDAP, Carbos, those kind of things. Um, as part of the 1.0 release, we'll have authorization capabilities. So, <coughs> so what actions can a particular user take based on their and then the API sort of takes actions to make sure that um, the web interface to the cobbler is updated, the TFTP boot has the right fixing kernels, um, the services themselves are up and running, and then the providing JCP is not followed up. Right now there is so right now it's a single environment. Single server environment. Um, the goal for us is not so much to put a failover environment together, but to have multiple systems that can replicate and synchronize. Um, so the other, system, other systems can take over. And the goal for that is to be able to scale to multiple data centers. <coughs> so you can put in the same stuff that it's for licensing. Uh, we talked a little bit about code, so let's uh, look at what code does. So code talks about uh, the XML RPC back to Cobbler, but within code, it has a couple of different variables. One is replace self. So if you already have a system and you want to replace it with another um, OS, another variation, or another function, it will go ahead and replace itself and pick whatever the new distribution you want to put on that. It will actually go ahead and modify the run interface. So when you reboot the new default grub menu entry will go ahead and start doing the installation. Um, Cone will also talk to Libvirt. Um, so right now as part of Libvirt we can do um, Polyvirt and Powerbird installations. Um, KVM installations um, we're looking at VMware as one of the extensions. So yeah. So Cone, that's all. So from a customization perspective, uh, one of the things that we can do is well, mention Chica template. So templates can apply to Kickstore, um, templates can apply to DHCP, um, to the TFTP tree, um, to your young configuration, uh, how we define the repos. Uh, there's triggers, so we can now add a lot of uh, functionality in the triggers. So the triggers can be invoked whenever there's an addition, deletion, or a sync action that happens. And the actions could be either on a distro, on a profile, on a system, or a repo. So for example, if somebody uh, added a new repo to <coughs> the Cobbler infrastructure, you could have an email go out telling everybody, hey, this repo has been updated, or if you have an automated repo sync action. <coughs> um, if you added a new system to the Cobbler infrastructure, you could have a trigger that says, uh, well, when the system gets installed, notify or install certain configuration files into your monitoring infrastructure. So now that system is automatically on. Uh, things like that. So if you, similarly, if you delete a system, you want to take it out of your monitoring system and get rid of it. Uh, from a modules perspective, OpN is our authentication piece, and the MODC is the um, authorization piece. And then we're adding additional capabilities from the storage perspective. Um, so the storage is really talking about the backend storage for cloud. So right now we're scaling to about you know 2,000 systems as I mentioned, and then we're expanding with a lot of flat files. And the flat files are managed through um, the YAML repository. Yet another one. One of the things that we're looking at is well, what happens if we want to change the backend storage into a database or something else that can be supported? So the storage, uh, the configuration files of Cobbler itself is also modular. Um, so we can put in a database. Um, and then the whole thing is a Python API. So yeah, extensibly from the Python perspective. Um, in terms of future plans that we're looking at, uh, there are a number of requests for enhancements that have been put forth. Um, so from a priority standpoint, uh, they're all being tracked online. A um, couple of things that are happening right now is uh, we're looking at integrating with DNS. So if you have a system that goes into 
cobbler um, with the static IP address and the system name. Well, we can do DHCP. Why like, can't we do uh, bind for DNS? So just to be able to run the DNS itself. Um, from a performance perspective, we're looking at well, what happens when we simultaneously install a few thousand things. Okay. Uh, what is the load generation and how do we tune these things? Um, a lot of that will depend on how we tune Apache because we're serving up the files by default uh, to Apache. But if you have multiple repositories that we're pointing to externally, then that might be another way to do that. Uh, multi data center deployment. So, again, the discussion around how do you maintain a unique view of, you know, five, six, ten data centers, thousands of those. Uh, from a system deployment perspective, how do we deploy on VMware? How do we deploy on PowerPC and other hardware or localization sites? Um, how do we keep track of the status of these systems that are being deployed? So one of the things that Cobble actually <laughs> does today is that when you're in the process of deploying, um, we will send back the syslog information from the system while the system is installing to the Cobbler server so you can actually track the steps uh, through, through the status information. Um, but if you start getting into a larger um, deployment environment, how do you track that? Uh, what, what systems? Uh, another thing that we have in place right now is um, if you have a system that's already been deployed, you want to keep that Pixie boot capability enabled or not. What happens if the system boots? <coughs> do we reinstall through Pixie or do you turn that Pixie on or on and off as needed? So there is an enable or disable command to automatically uh, prevent the installations. And then, you know, as you mentioned earlier about, you know, how do we integrate with other tools? Uh, so we're looking at uh, Puppet, Small, and uh, Funk uh, as additional tools that we can integrate against. That's uh, that's Cobbler, so yeah. Could you provide a little hit, little background history on Cobbler and sort of where it began? Uh, Cobbler began because we were looking at um, something that could do provisioning for thousands of systems. When we started looking at the virtualization space, the understanding was, you know, people already have thousands of servers in production in a lot of spaces. But once we add virtualization, you're talking tens of thousands of servers. How do you manage the deployment of those efficiently uh, without having to bring together a large framework? You know, I don't necessarily want to deploy a huge application that does 10,000 things to be able to So Cobbler was designed to be small, flexible, and to scale. To but it's remote, remote, primarily for server-based applications only. Right. I mean, are you are you thinking about desktops and yeah? Um, we really didn't have desktops. Anymore. But I mean, from a provisioning <coughs> perspective, I don't. There's no difference. There's no difference. Yeah. So you could definitely use it. For we use the same tools already. We actually do it out of the SAP server, but uh, we actually are picking the desktop and it's boxes across the land. Uh, what is your role in the platform? Um, user and I file all the customer enhancements. I haven't written a lot. I haven't written a lot. What took the market to be the software that would actually pushing with Python that would possibly pass off to make like a clone of itself and say, Okay, any further instructions are meant for this machine will be handled by a machine that's just like me. And that way it would continue to install. Because a lot of times when you have production machines, right. they can't be stopped. You can't say, well, we're going to take down for like an hour, two hours. Mm -hmm. It would be nice if a machine could essentially assume the identity of another machine with all the data from, you know, essentially mirrored. Um. Yeah. Well, but but if, if if I take take the word that you're saying that assume the identity of that machine, right? If I assume the identity of a machine, then all tasks are going to come to me. So what's that other guy going to do? Right? Identity and task orientation has to be has to go together. Um, 
if you're thinking of, you know, creating new instances to um, handle the workload, um, so if you're if you have an IP address that's virtualized for a load balancer and you want to scale the load behind the load balancer, um, then yeah, there should be some resource management policy that says go ahead and install new instances to handle that workload. Um, that type of resource management policy is not part of Cobbler's scope. Um, so if you had a resource management policy that says, you know, our workload across these 10 servers behind the load balancer is already reaching, you know, 80%, let's deploy a couple more servers, that resource manager could then invoke the Cobbler XML you know, API and says, go ahead and install three servers and you're up and running. Um, so something like that could be done, but from purely a systems um, resource manager, Cobbler is still present. Before you mentioned the issues of licensing with Microsoft, what is there actually we're just your state? <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's not I mean, so much the state. So, so, for example, if we were to look, start looking at Microsoft's risk installation stuff, right? Um, in order for us to really go in and look at it, we would have to initially license the software uh, to look at it, but then the question becomes, as we start looking at that technology, is there anything behind it that gets us into trouble? Is there a patent or is there something else that they have put in place? Um, so for example, in um, LWM this week, there was this whole um, article about, well, there's this case splice program hack, what do you call it, that can catch a running kernel. Um, People said, you know, it's a hack, but you know, who would use it? But then somebody mentioned, well, Microsoft has a patent on it. And so, you know, for patching online kernel, which people have done since PDP 11 days. But if, if, if we start looking at that and, and putting that in place, then we open ourselves up to other issues. So, some of the patents that Microsoft has on this sort of fluff, I mean, they're really not legitimate. I mean, they're, they're not legitimate. I don't have the money to defend this. I'd rather not get in that. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. 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 So, cobbler.ep.redhat.com or Fedora hosted. So, Red Hat has products Well, Red Hat has everything. Well, let's say 90% of the products that Red Hat has is GPL, so Enterprise Linux is fully GPL. So, so, when people talk about CentOS and you know, Scientific Linux, those are all essentially recomposed from our source code. <laughs> right, so, 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 from a free perspective, Source code is available for everyone. Also, uh, just latest free update on uh, what Red Hat has done. Uh, Dogtail is now completely open source, which is formally known as the Red Hat certificate system. So it's the same thing. So all their PKI bits, they just open source all that. That was great. Thank you very, very much. Everyone, thanks for. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Resolution signals. Let's bring all the conversations to Stantich over at TGI Fridays, get some food and refreshment. Uh, uh, you have a hard stop at 8, and I appreciate everybody in the speaking on time. Thanks again, and we'll see you at the end of next month.